Now, not until the last two years of the war, 1864 and 5, does the North really have commanders who understand what this war is all about. And these, of course, we'll get to them, of course, Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman. Here's Grant, the great Union commander, who developed, Grant and Sherman developed the concept of total war, total war. We will see this develop, as it, but for now, it's significant. Neither of them was really a West Point type. Grant was at West Point. He both of them were graduated from West Point. Grant was at West Point, but he hated it, and he kept reading the newspapers in the 1840s to try, hoping that West Point would be abolished so he could go home. There was debate about that. It was seen as an aristocratic institution. Sherman lived in the South before the war and was somewhat mentally, well, quite depressed anyway at the uh, end, at the beginning of the war. He suffered from depression. Um, neither, but both of them had extensive experience in the Mexican War, and it was experience, not West Point training, that they drew on. In fact, you know, there's a story. After the war, a group of businessmen in New York decided to honor Grant by giving him, donating to him, a, uh, a library of military history books. And, um, but being businessmen, they didn't want to waste their money, so they said, well, you tell us what books you have, and we won't give you duplicates. We'll give you other books. And Grant said, well, I don't actually have any such books. I don't read military strategy or military history because it's irrelevant to what's going on nowadays. Um, Grant had this incredible capacity of self-control, self-reliance, attentiveness. Um, Grant is the only general, either side, who can see the entire battlefield in his head, so to speak, in his mind's eye. You know, at the beginning, yeah, here's, these guys are here, these guys are there. Once the battle begins, reports start coming in from all over the place, this guy's over here, we have to have reinforcements. And literally, most generals, they, they really had like a, a, a map and little thing. They'd move, okay, this guy, move this guy over like little chess men. Not Grant, he kept it all in his head. He could see what was going on just from the reports without having to sort of physically have it embodied. Um, and uh, most generals could not think beyond the scope of their own vision. They had to have something to look at to understand what was going on. Not Grant. He had this incredible power of concentration. Now, Grant and Sherman <coughs> totally integrate politics and war by the end of the war. Sherman's March to the Sea, which we'll talk about. Not a very popular guy in Georgia, I understand that. Um, Atlanta to the Sea with great destruction. Why? There was no army in his way. He was not, there was no military target marching from Atlanta to Atlanta. The target was Southern morale. My aim, he said, was to whip the rebels, humble their pride, follow them into their innermost recesses and make them fear us. It's not just the destruction of uh, economic resources, but the destruction of morale that is the target here. There's, this is long, a long way away from any romanticism about war, like uh, had been there at the beginning of the war, romanticism about professionals. And Grant, too, Adam Badeau, his aide de camp wrote after the war, he said, above all, Grant understood he was engaged in a people's war. People versus people, not army versus army. The people, as well as the armies of the South, must be conquered. That means slaves, supplies, crops, stock, as well as arms and ammunition, must be, the enemy must be deprived of them. Anything that helped them think they could continue the war should becomes a target, and so you get, um, you know, a very destructive, uh, the last two years of the war are very destructive in the South. Here's a, a destroyed rail bridge by uh, Sherman's troops, just, you know, to impede the flow of goods in, uh, in, in the Confederacy. Here, of course, is uh, one of the iconic pictures of Richmond. Uh, this is a flour mill, I think, after the fires that destroyed Richmond when the Union Army finally entered the city in 1865. But, so, you know, the, 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 how should I put it? The line between military targets and civilian targets begins to erode as the, um, as the Civil War, as the Civil War goes on. As I say, the, Sherman says, 
War is cruelty and you cannot refine it. If the people raise a howl against me for barbarity, I say war is not popularity seeking. If they want peace, they must stop the war. That's it. If you don't like what's going on, stop the war, don't fight, it'll all be over, says Sherman. That's the only way to win this war. So the Civil War should have destroyed any idea of the romanticism of war. Unfortunately, it seems every generation has to learn that lesson for itself. When World War I rolled around, people again marched out with the flags flying and the drums beating and it was going to be a great glorious thing, etc., etc. People always seem to go to war with that and then they discover that's not really what it's all about. Um, but this, you know, so the Civil War creates the American way of warfare, which is total war. And it is soon transferred to other venues. It's not an accident that it's in the years after the Civil War that the great fight against the Plains Indians takes place in the same way. What do they do to defeat the Plains Indians? They destroy the buffalo because that's what they live on, right? So you go after their infrastructure, not just armed men. Um, many of these Civil War generals, Sheridan and were out there directing the suppression of the Plains Indians. In 1871, Sherman was over in France when the Franco-Prussian War, the war between Prussia and France was taking place, and he was there with the Prussian army which was surrounding, you know, uh, um, encircling Paris. And Sherman said, well, what is this with these guys? These Germans are pussycats. What's the matter with them? They don't, they don't, you know, why aren't they bombarding the city? Why aren't they trying to destroy everything? You know, no, the Germans are kind of nice guys. They don't know how to fight a modern war. Um, and you can, you know, then you can run back in the 1960s, there were many books published trying to link Sherman's March to the Sea and the Vietnam War. Although that's really unfair to Sherman because Sherman's March just destroyed property. They did not go after civilians. He protected civilians. Property was the target, not people. In Vietnam, you had what they called these free fire zones where anybody who moved was assumed to be an enemy and could be, could be, um, could be legitimately shot. So just, we will start really talking about the Civil War next time, but the, the Civil War, my point is, shaped modern America in ways both very good and bad. It brought about a, a new birth of freedom. It destroyed the institution of slavery. It brought about, if you like this or not, the rise of the powerful national state. That's why libertarians today condemn Lincoln as a tyrant because the national state, which barely existed before the war, is now created by the very effort to mobilize resources for the war. Um, and it uh, should have destroyed a certain element of American self-consciousness, which is exceptionalism. The idea that our government is based on consent whereas everyone else's government is based on force. But unfortunately, sad to say, government rests on power. And that is what the Civil War, the reason the United States is a single nation today is power, not consent. And in that sense, the war suggests we aren't really all that different from all those other countries in the world. So next time we will go into the first year of the war and um, see how this happens chronologically.